What's going on engineers? In this video we're going to look at Linux and macOS command line basics. I chose to include macOS in this video as well just because Unix and Unix-like operating systems like macOS as well as Linux will all have the same sort of basic commands that you can do and it's going to be the ones we're going to look at in this video. However, in this video, just like all the videos, we'll be working in Linux. When I think of command line basics, the first thing, of course, that comes to mind is what exactly is a command line? And the simple answer to that is a command line is a place where you can type various commands that will tell a computer to take one or more actions. And there's going to be many examples of that in this video. When I think about what are some basic command line commands, things like tree navigation, file directory manipulation, reading and editing of files, some miscellaneous commands, and then performing commands as an escalated privilege super user. It's that sort of stuff that comes to mind. So let's just jump in and review all of those as well as some tips and tricks along the way. So we've opened up our terminal and this is what we see. And what we're actually looking at is something called a shell. And a shell is going to be the thing that the terminal actually starts when the terminal opens. The shell I'm using here is something called bash. And there's a ton of different shells that you can get. For the purpose of this video, it's not important that you know necessarily what shell you're in, just because all the commands we're gonna look at work in all shells, but just know that this is the bash shell. So in here, we're able to type anything we want. However, it needs to be something that's valid. So if we type like, hello, how are you? And we do that, it says command hello not found. Of course, hello is not a command. So the shell responds with command hello not found. So let's issue a couple of commands that actually do something. So the first command we'll do is something called who am I? And when I type who am I and hit enter, I'm instructing the computer to run the program called who am I? And then the program will run and it will return the output. Now the output for the program who am I is going to be the currently logged in user. In this case, it's Brian. So let's look at a second simple command called PWD. What this does is it prints the working directory that you're currently in. So I'll hit enter and then the output of this program is slash home slash Brian slash demo. And each time you issue a command, it says constant loop. You type the command, you hit enter, the program runs, the program sends the output back to you and then you're back ready to type another command. The next command we're going to look at is a command called cd, which is change directory. And this is also going to be the first command where we're going to introduce something called an argument. So if I type only cd and hit enter, what it does is it takes me back to my home directory. And we can see that if we use the pwd command again, we can see that now I'm at slash home slash Brian. But what if I want to navigate back to the demo folder? This is where we'd use an argument. So to get back to the demo folder, we actually have to do cd space demo. And if we break down what's happening here, we know that cd is the command, and then demo is going to be the first argument. When I run this command, it changes us back into the demo folder. The thing about arguments is it's up to the program to do something with them. Of course, if we type pwd, we get the working directory. We could supply an argument to pwd, you know, we'll say like pwd hello. And, but it does the same thing. And that's because PWD doesn't actually do anything with an argument. Or more specifically, PWD doesn't do anything with that argument, which is to say that hello is not a valid argument for PWD. So we're able to change directories now, but what if we wanna see the actual files in a directory? The command we're gonna use for that is called ls, which will list the files. So if we do ls, we can see that there's one folder called chasepix. Now ls on its own with no arguments is kind of primitive. If we want to get a nice list of everything in a directory, we can use an argument called dash l. So we can do ls dash l. This will give us a better list of what's going on. And we can now see a couple important pieces of information in addition to the actual name of the files. One is the permissions, the owner, and then the group. So if we wanted to navigate into the folder called chasepix, what would we do? Well, we would type cd chasepix. Now, of course, we could type out chase picks entirely, but your shell is smart enough to know that if there's only one file in the directory and you've supplied enough to where it knows exactly which one to pick, you can actually just hit the tab button and it will just auto complete it for you. And now that's auto completed, I can hit enter. I can issue my ls l command again to see what's in this directory. And I can see that there's three pictures. If I print working directory, I can see I'm now in slash home slash Brian slash demo slash chase picks. But what if I want to go backwards one directory? Certainly I could do cd slash home slash Brian slash demo, but there's an easier way. And it's, there's something special called dot dot. When you say dot dot, what you're referring to is the previous folder. So by saying change directory to dot dot, you go backwards one directory. And we can confirm that we are in fact back one directory with either pwd or just ls-l, which will show us the previous directory. The next set of commands we're gonna look at are those that do file and directory manipulation. And specifically, we're gonna look at touch, mv, cp, rm, mkdir, and rmdir. 
although we're going to do them slightly out of order. So to make a new directory, we're going to issue the mkdir command, and we're going to supply an argument with the name of the directory we want to create. So we'll call it personal. Doing an ls-l, we can see now that we have a new directory called personal. If we want to remove that directory, we can do rmdir personal. Now rmdir will only work if the directory has nothing in it. If the directory has anything in it at all, you can still remove the directory and all of its content, but you'll have to use a separate command. So for now, we'll just remake that directory and then we will change directory into it. Next command is called touch and touch among other things is an easy way to create blank files. So if we want to create a file called like songs.txt, we could do touch songs.txt and then we can do ls-l just to see that file there now. We'll create a couple other files as well, just so we have stuff to manipulate. So we'll do something like touch cars.txt and also food.txt. Do ls l, we could see we have our three files. So, the three basic operations we can do to a file is to move it, copy it, or remove it. And you'll notice that there is no rename command, and that's because rename is basically moving it from one place to another but with a different name. So, if I wanted to rename cars to say books, I could do mv cars and then rename it to books.txt. The command format for MV is MV source destination. So it says take the source cars.txt and move it to destination books.txt. And you could also use this to move it to an entirely separate folder if you wanted to. CP has the exact same signature. So if we wanted to copy songs.txt to songs2.txt, we could do CP songs.txt songs2.txt. And then we'll just do ls-l so we can see. Now we have books, food, songs2, and songs. And of course, finally is rm. rm takes one argument, or well, one or more arguments, files to delete. So if we want to delete songs2, maybe we don't need it. We can do rm songs2, and that will get rid of that file. So that's what we're going to look at is this dash r option for both cp and rm. You remember back when I said rm dir couldn't remove a directory, didn't have anything in it? Well, now that we have a folder called personal with stuff in it, we can try it. rm dir personal. You can see it says fail to remove, directory not empty. The same is true of rm, that also would not work. And also even cp doesn't work. If we wanted to copy that folder, say personal to personal2, you can see that it's not going to allow it, omitting directory personal dash r not specified. What the dash r option does is it makes it recursive. That is, it goes into each folder and then copies everything in that folder as well as going into additional folders and copying everything. So dash r can be thought of as copy or remove this entire folder to somewhere else or delete it. Now, as you can imagine, that's both very powerful and possibly very dangerous. If you run an rm dash r on say your home directory, it will delete your entire home directory or at least the stuff that you have access to. So if we wanted to copy the personal folder to say personal2, we'd have to do cp-r for recursive, specify the source folder, and then specify the destination folder. So we'll call it personal2. What I have now is I have an identical copy of that folder, but now in a different folder. If I want to remove both of those, and here again, this is the dangerous command, I can do rm-r personal. So I'll delete one folder called personal, and then I'll delete also the personal2, hit enter, and then both of those are gone. Now note additionally that at no time has Linux ever said, are you sure? And that's because it's just going to do it by default. So be very careful with that stuff. Next we're going to look at reading and editing files. For reading, it's going to be things like cat, less, more, and tail. And then for editing files, it's going to be things like nano and vim. I have this brand new file called text.json. And the simplest way to read and see what's in a file is simply to do cat and then the name of the file, hit enter, and then it'll show you. Now, of course, this is sometimes useful if there's not a whole lot in the file, but in this case, I have a lot of data and it would take me forever to scroll up. And even if I was able to get to the top, the terminal will only show so many lines as a history. So if my file has 8,000 lines and I can only scroll up, say, 200 lines, then I'm missing out on 7,800 lines. But we have a really nifty command that will solve this, and it's called less. If we type less and then we specify the file name, text.json, then what it will do is it'll open up into this program called less and it'll start at the very top of the file. Among many other things that less can do, less gives us the basic ability to scroll through this file by way of your arrow keys, both up and down, your page down and page up keys. And of course you can just go straight to the end and straight to home. So this makes it really easy to browse through a file without a ton of effort. You know, if you know what you're looking for is at the end, simply hit end and then just, you know, page up for some stuff and, you can do whatever you want. 
And once you're done looking at the file, you just simply click the Q key, which will quit you out of that program. Another neat command for looking at files, particularly looking at files in real time, is a command called tail. If you run the command tail with the option dash F for follow, and then you supply the name of the file to follow, in this case text.json, it will show you a portion of the end of the file, but what it will do is, as new stuff is added to the file, it will show up immediately here. So on a separate terminal, I'm basically going to just add some additional stuff. You can see that every time I add new stuff in there, and I'm doing this on a, it's, it's off the screen, I'm just adding additional data into this file. And each time I do that, you can see it shows up in this terminal here. This is really, really great for things like logs. Now to exit from tail, you'll have to do control C. And it's different from Q for less because tail does not implement Q, so you gotta do control C. And what control C does is it actually issues a signal to the program to say it should terminate. Anytime you're stuck in a program that doesn't have an obvious way to exit, control C can be one of the first things you try. The last thing is adding files. There's tons of different programs that you can use at the terminal to add a file. It's all preference-based, so I'm not going to go into any of them in depth, but they all still function the same as any other command. So if you wanted to open a file and edit it with nano, you could type nano and then specify the file that you want to edit, so like text.json. Once I'm in my editor, I could make whatever changes I wanted to make, and then I could save and exit. Up to this point, we haven't had a need or talked about doing anything as a super user with escalated privileges, but here's an example of where you would need to do that. So I created a file here called changeme.txt. It's owned by root and its group is root. So what if I wanted to make myself the owner? Basically, I want to change root to Brian. So if I wanted to, the command for that is ch own. I specify then Brian for the owner and then the name of the file, and you can see that it says operation not permitted. So there's two ways I can make this change go through. I can either hit up, I can go back to the beginning of the command, and I can type sudo, which will run the command after sudo as a super user and hit enter, and you can see now it goes through. If I then do ls-l, I can see now that it's currently owned by Brian Brian. So I set the file to be owned by root again. The second way to do it is, and this is the way you'd want to do it if you have a lot of stuff you have to do as what we call root, then what you can do is sudo-s. And what this does is this takes the current shell that you're currently in, and then it drops you down to root. Now once you've dropped down to root, and you'll know you're a root user because it'll say root at, and then the name of the computer. Once you're a root user, you have complete control and free reign of the entire system, and you can do whatever you want with it, nothing will stop you. So from here you can now do your work, and you don't have to specify sudo anymore. Everything you type as a root user is implied to be as sudo. So I can just do change ownership, you know, Brian, change me. And that's it, we're all set. It's worth mentioning that it's not advisable to be root all the time because anytime you are root, anything you execute while you are root also has root permissions. So if you happen to execute a script that's maybe malicious in nature and you happen to be root, that script, which is malicious in nature, will also in effect be root. So the typical best practice is to operate as an unprivileged user, in this case, Brian, and then anytime you gotta do some actual work on the system, you can drop to root or you can simply use sudo. Now, once you've done all the work, if you do not want to be root anymore, you simply type exit, or you can also hit control D, either one's fine. And then we'll just talk about a couple of miscellaneous commands. So the first one is clear. If you want to just get rid of everything on your screen, you can simply type clear, and then it'll just get rid of it all. Next is exit. I won't run it because that'll leave the terminal, but it'll just shut down your terminal. Power off and reboot, that should be obvious what that does. If you run reboot, reboot your computer. If you run power off, it'll just power off your computer. Next one is man, and this is a really important one. What man is, is it shows you man pages. So if you do man, and you specify a command, we'll say like clear, and then you hit enter, it'll give you this manual for it. And anytime you're not sure how a command works, you can just resort to the man page. And this will tell you exactly how it works. It'll tell you the name of the command, it'll tell you all the possible flags and options, and then this works a lot like a less, so you can just scroll down with your arrow keys or your page up and page down, and you can see all the different options. You can even see a history, and there's tons of really interesting data in the man pages. And there's pretty much a man page for every single command on the system. And once you're done, just click Q, and that'll get you out of there. And finally, the last one is history and history-c. If you type history, it'll show you the history of everything you've typed in over the last however long you've been using the terminal. 
and then finally history-c, that will just clear your entire history. However, it's kind of deceiving because what history-c does is it clears the history that you racked up during your current session. It will not clear all the history. It'll just clear what you've done during that session. And that's really it for command line basics. It's, it's worth mentioning that we've barely scratched the surface as to what the command line and Linux shells can actually do, but this is a real good primer you know, to get you moving. You should at this point at least know what the command line is and be comfortable running programs, navigating directories, manipulating files, and some various other things that I showed you. Those are kind of really foundational things for working in the command line. From there, it's really just finding different commands that you want to run and then checking them out. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, go ahead and leave them below in the comments. And other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.